So welcome, everybody. We're starting a little late because we figured folks were having trouble getting in through the rain. I know I got real wet walking in here. I had a little umbrella, but it wasn't enough. So the rain is coming down. It's supposed to get worse, too, I think, from about 1 to 4 today. So just as a warning. But welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to be in this great old building, Julia Morgan designed. Berkeley City Club, Berkeley Historic Landmark, uh, wonderful ceiling, windows, the whole thing, just really quite nice. Um, and it's obviously thrilling to be here for the Goldman School's 40th anniversary. Now, I'm going to tell you a just so story about why we know this is really the 40th anniversary, uh, but it turns out actually it's a little more complicated than that, and, and getting the actual date at which the school began is not a trivial task. There's a lot of different dates that are sort of relevant. Um, so anyway, welcome to everybody. We've got some students, we've got faculty, uh, staff, and alumni, of course. Uh, we've got a distinguished panel here. Before we start with them, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the history of the school and remind you of it. I'm sure many of you have heard this in one form or another, but it's, it's sort of fun. I've gone through some old documents that Martha Chavez uh, got for me. Uh, as you know, Aaron Waldowski was the founding dean, but there's a prehistory to the school. The prehistory is that in 1960, according to the minutes of the University of California Academic Senate, uh, Frederick Mosier of the Political Science Department proposed a degree of the Master of Public Administration. This is 1960, 1960. And that was going to be, and was, in fact, in the Political Science Department. And let me just read you some of the courses uh, that were part of that degree, because it doesn't sound at all like what we've got now. Public Administration in its Social and Political Setting. Theory of Organization and Administration. Well, that's one we might teach today. Public Personnel Administration. That's how to grade bureaucrats and things like that. Um, municipal government, municipal administration, financial management, organization and management. So a really heavy management administration focus, virtually no focus at all on analysis at all. And indeed, there's even a discussion about internships, and it says in this 1960 document that there will be a small internship program, but it's not something they're going to do on a regular basis. Don't think it's a great idea. So. Uh, a, a policy that we've obviously changed. So then fast forward, the next document I have, now Aaron was named Dean, Aaron Waldowski in 1969, uh, to the best of my knowledge. But here's a document from September 16th, 1970, and it's proposing a new degree of Masters of Public Policy. Uh, it's being proposed by Aaron and a committee of the Academic Senate. Uh, there's also a uh, move to change the school's name which was initially the School of Public Affairs. Uh, Aaron always had a little joke about that. Many of you may know uh, that affairs should be private and not public, and therefore it should be the School of Public Policy or something like that. Although what's interesting in this document is it's proposing to go from the Graduate School of Public Affairs to the Graduate School of Policy Analysis. And does anybody remember it being called that? Because I, I didn't even know it ever had that little incarnation. But apparently, at least in this document, it was going to be the Graduate School of Policy Analysis. But the next documents we find, it's the Graduate School of Public Policy. And the, the master's degree is the master's of public policy here. So somehow, policy analysis didn't stick, but public policy did. Policy can be public. That's good. That's OK. So let me just read you the courses for this, which sound remarkably like what we've got now. Um, a Practicum Laboratory and Systemic, or Systematic, I'm not sure systemic is the right word, but that's what's here, in Systematic Policy Analysis, uh, Integrated Seminars and Courses on Theory and Method in the Analysis of Public Policy, uh, and then a heavy dose of Quantitative Methods, Political Process and Environment, uh, Economic Theory and Analysis, and Organization Theory and Behavior. That begins looking a lot like the modern curriculum, and so this is 1970. Uh, and the founding faculty, at least the best list I can come up with, were Aaron Waldowski, Jean Bardak, uh, we're hoping Jean shows up at some of the events throughout the day, Bob Biller, who passed away recently, David Kirp, who's still on the faculty, Bart McGuire, who's passed away, Arnold Meltzner, who lives in uh, Palm Desert, California, actually I think it's Rancho Mirage, 
Uh, Alan Sindler, who lives across the bay, Percy Tannenbaum, who, who passed away last year, Frank Trinkle, Martin Tro, who passed away a few years ago, and Gerald Weber. Uh, so we have several of those faculty members who still are with us. Gene Bardak is still teaching with us, and David Kirp, of course, but uh, a lot of the rest of them are, are, have passed away or are no longer uh, uh, affiliated with the school directly. Um, it's quite a distinguished initial faculty. Aaron did an extraordinary job of picking up people. One of the interesting things, by the way, is notice Percy Tannenbaum, a psychologist. Uh, we were the first public policy school, to our knowledge, to really focus on having a social psychologist on the faculty, and Percy took on that uh, role with uh, gusto. And now we've got two social psychologists, Jack Glazer and Rob McCoon, on the faculty. And other schools, like the Woodrow Wilson School, have uh, that as a specialty and an important part of the curriculum. So. Uh, obviously that was a real innovation. Another thing we had as an innovation was to have a law course uh, because early on we focused on politics and implementation and the role of law and politics in making sure that policies could get enacted. That's a very Waldowski kind of approach because as you, many of you know, Aaron's early work often was critical of cost-benefit analysis because the school grew out of the 60s effort to try to understand how we could make better public policies through economic analysis, operations research, quantitative methods, uh, approaches like that. And one of Aaron's greatest contributions, along with Arnold Meltzner and Gene Bardak, was to say, wait a minute, turns out rational policy analysis is not going to do it all, that there's this thing called politics that gets in the way, which you may notice in your daily newspapers, um, and that politics getting in the way means sometimes things don't get done the way the rational policy analyst says they should. And therefore, we have to pay attention to politics, and we have to pay attention to implementation. And that's been a distinguishing feature of the school uh, ever since. So let me then just go quickly through I'm not going to do each year here, uh, but I'm just going to tell you the, the deans that we've had. Uh, Aaron was dean, the founding dean from 1969 to 1977, gave the school an extraordinary start. Alan Sindler, who actually, interestingly enough, had been Aaron's teacher at Yale, uh, was the next dean. Uh, and it, he, one of the things he did was hire me along the way, which I'm eternally grateful for. And he also hired some other distinguished, uh, well, other faculty members. They were distinguished, let's put it that way. Um, and. Uh, the next dean was Gene Smolensky. Uh, Gene did a lot of great things, but one of the most important things was working with his associate dean, uh, Lee Friedman, to get the Goldman gift, which made possible the second building uh, and the renovation of the old building. Because as you know, one of the things Aaron quickly did when he became dean was to get the old Beta Theta Pi fraternity house uh, as the uh, building for the school. We outgrew that as we went along, and we needed a new building. We got the Goldman gift, and we built our second beautiful new building, which has just been a joy to have, and it created a little campus for us, and it meant that we have a 19th century building and a 21st century building, which is sort of nice. Um, Michael Nock then became dean. Michael actually oversaw the building of the new building, the renovation of the uh, uh, old one, uh, with two really difficult tasks. Uh, he also created an advisory board for the school, uh, created a real development effort, um, continued the relationship with the Goldman School, which actually culminated when I became dean in another $5 million gift, which was very nice, um, and helped to expand the school's resources and doubled the size of the student body. So we're now up around 80 students entering each year, so a total of 200 students when you get people who are in three-year programs and you get the PhDs and everything else. Uh, and we also have an undergraduate minor as well, which has hundreds of students in it. And then, uh, along after Michael, uh, I became dean, and I've been lucky enough to, uh, to deal with a school when it's really in extraordinarily good shape. And certainly during these times, that's a great joy. It could be really tough being the dean of a school at the University of California, Berkeley, if it weren't in the shape that this one is in, which is highly esteemed around the country, rated among the one, top one or two public policy schools in the country. We recently had an outside review which reaffirmed that fact. Uh, they said, we are simply the best at what we do, full stop. Pound for pound, the best uh, school in the country. We sometimes wish we had more poundage uh, because we're small. Uh, but nevertheless, pound for pound, we're, we're clearly uh, the best. Uh, I've also been lucky enough to get a chance to hire some people. Uh, I've hired, uh, well, actually made sure that Jesse Rothstein, who's on this panel, didn't go away. 
which was uh, tr tremendous because Jesse uh, was uh, at the uh, Council of Economic Advisors as a staff member, got a bunch of other offers. Uh, we'd already hired him, but we managed to convince him that he should come back to Berkeley. Uh, and not Wisconsin, by the way, which was one of your outside offers. And aren't you glad? <laughs> Didn't we do you a favor? <laughs> Whatever problems Berkeley has, I'm not sure I'd want to be at the University of Wisconsin right now. Uh, and then we just hired, literally just hired this week, and I'm really thrilled to announce it, uh, Sarah Anzia, who is a political science PhD uh, at the Stanford University. Uh, she studies a topic which I think is of some importance, which is unions in the public sector. Uh, so public sector unions, I think that's a tremendous addition to the school and to have somebody obviously dealing with that topic right now. Uh, the only problem she says is that she's working on a book on the topic and she wishes she had it out already. Um, but uh, nevertheless, she's got a real spur to get it out quickly given the uh, importance of that topic right now. We've also hired Jennifer Granholm, uh, ex-governor uh, of Michigan, as a lecturer. And we're really pleased about that. She was here about two or three weeks ago, gave a lecture that was extraordinarily well attended. Uh, she's literally a rock star on the stage. She's a very impressive lecturer. And I'm just looking forward to having her in the classroom. We're going to have a stop the clock uh, week's activity in about two or three weeks as part of our curriculum, where we're going to coordinate all of our classes and have Governor Granholm come into the classes. And we've designed case studies, like one of, around a town in Michigan which she tried to uh, save uh, because there was a firm, the Electrolux firm, which built refrigerators. Uh, in, I always thought of Electrolux as making vacuum cleaners, but apparently they also made refrigerators. And she tried to save it by subsidies, and we're going to analyze whether that was a good idea or not. And so we have another case study um, on, uh, I think it's job training for our other uh, class, and a variety of other activities really built around the fact uh, that Governor Granholm is, going to, is on our faculty now and can talk about the uh, real practicalities and the real issues surrounding some of these issues. And our students can, can do some of the policy analysis. So where are we? 40 years. Oh, by the way, can I date it 40 years? Here's my argument for 40 years, and, and then I'll introduce the panel. I was talking to Gene Bardak, and I said, you know, really, sort of it was 69 that Aaron came. And he said, yeah, yeah, but we didn't really start the new curriculum until and in fact, you could see in the document I cited, until 1970. So the first class with the new curriculum, 7071, was 40 years ago. So what we're celebrating really is not, and also probably it wasn't even the public policy school yet. It was still probably the School of Public Affairs. I keep finding more reasons to tell you it's really the 40th anniversary. Uh, it's the 40th anniversary of our name uh, and of our curriculum, and those are really the important features of what we're about, especially the curriculum, because our curriculum, uh, along with a few other schools around the country, helped revolutionize how public policy uh, was taught in America. So without further ado, let me turn to this panel. It's, the whole goal here was to get panels uh, that had distinguished alumni. Um, and so uh, we wanted to show uh, the extraordinary people who have gone through the Goldman School, and that turns out to be awfully easy given that we have so many distinguished alumni. Uh, so here we have a panel on the economy, featuring distinguished alumni, and I'll let Bob Reich take it from here, and you're going to introduce the panelists, Bob. I am. Good. I am. Go for it. Uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, before I begin, though, happy birthday <laughs> to everybody. Uh, I want to uh, particularly thank the staff here who put this together. Uh, it is very, 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 very difficult to put anything together, as you know, administratively and every other way. And uh, our staff continues to just shine. And thank them, and happy birthday to all of them. Uh, and Henry, you as well. I just want to embarrass you for a moment, because your energy and verve and drive and excitement that you bring to the, your job is absolutely infectious. And I have not seen this place just feel as dynamic and as turned on to what we are already and have been turned on to for years, but as a group, we are just doing wonderfully well. And it's because of you, and thank you for being our dean. Uh, that was an applause line, by the way. <laughs> Uh, there should be a big light up here. Applause. Uh, look, I, um, 
what we're going to do this morning is talk about something that is near and dear to all of your hearts and mine and our distinguished panelists up here who are uh, Goldman School graduates. And I want to go just very rapidly introduce them. Uh, to my right, Elizabeth Hill. Uh, she, Elizabeth uh, commenced a career in state government in 1976, uh, joining California's Legislative Analyst Office. Uh, uh, Liz got her MPP in 1975. Uh, she, st she was appointed California Legislative Analyst in 1986, and then was there for three decades. I mean, if there's anybody who understands uh, the California budget, and uh, in fact, I don't think anybody understands the California budget, <laughs> but anybody who comes close to understanding the California budget and California finances, it is Liz, but uh, Liz's knowledge of public finance goes far beyond California. We'll take advantage of it this morning. Uh, and as legislative uh, analyst, she served uh, in a nonpartisan fashion, uh, f serving as fiscal advisors uh, to both houses of the California legislature, overseeing the preparation of annual fiscal and policy analyses, uh, and has been recognized in so many ways. Public official of the year. Liz, we are just delighted you are with us. Uh, to my immediate left uh, is Mickey Levy, a class of 1974. Uh, Mickey has had an extraordinary uh, career. Uh, chief economist now for the Bank of America, analyzes and forecasts U.S. and global economic performance and financial market behavior. Uh, uh, Dr. Levy serves on the Shadow Open Market Committee and is an advisor to several Federal Reserve banks. Uh, I, in my professional life, come across his reports and his quotes and his analyses all the time. Uh, this is my first, first opportunity to meet him. Uh, Dr. Levy has testified before U.S. congressional committees on all sorts of topics ranging uh, from the Federal Reserve, monetary policy, fiscal policy, budget policies, economic and bank credit institutions. And we are also delighted to have you with us here today, Mickey. Uh, and not the least, Jesse Rothstein, uh, I'm proud to say, uh, a new colleague of mine on the faculty, class of 2000, MPP 2000. Uh, uh, Jesse is a public and labor economist uh, with researching, research focusing on public institutions that ameliorate uh, uh, the effects of children's families, uh, the effect, uh, reinforced with regard to the effects of poverty on children's families uh, and their academic and economic outcomes, among many other things. Uh, Jesse has also been looking at racial gaps in education, uh, the causes and consequences of racial segregation, the role of housing markets in allocating uh, access to good schools, evaluation of teacher quality. These are all uh, issues that are not only matters of social policy, but one of the things we try to do at the Goldman School, as you know, you were there, those of you who uh, understand uh, what we are trying to do, is integrate social and economic policy. You can't really separate the two. They are inextricably interrelated. Uh, Jesse is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, and in 2009 and 10, served as a senior economist for the Council of Economic Advisors, and then capped his career uh, as chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't know quite where you go from there, but you've, you've tried, you've tried, and we're, we're delighted not only that you're here today, Jesse, but that you are with us on the Goldman School faculty. Uh, so I've got, here's what the way I thought we'd do it. I have a series of questions. Can I interrupt? No. Yes. I want to add three points. Um, you've left out of my resume that, um, Dean Brady and I went to high school together, and his brother dated my sister. That's one point. Um, the second point about Aaron Woldowski, the most fun report I ever wrote was when I was in graduate school and was on the California wine industry before it started. And Woldowski loved the report so much when he moved to his new house in Oakland, he gave me a blank check to fill out his cellar. And that was fun. And the third point was, GSPP, way back when, had a basketball team, and we played in a league with other schools. And um, we were decidedly mediocre, and um, 
going into one game, only four of us showed up. <laughs> and Liz Hill, this is before Title IX. <laughs> Liz Hill, who had played basketball on the women's team at Stanford, we asked her to join us, and I think she ended up being captain of our team because she was better than everybody else. So those are my three points. <laughs> you know, Mickey, I would like to propose that we delay the economic discussion and talk about your high school adventures, particularly with our dean. Uh, uh, I mean, I've heard legends of dating and high school, and, but if you'd like to begin on that, no? No, all right. Economics is more fun. I doubt it. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion here among us. I've got a lot of questions and some uh, uh, open-ended, and I'd like our panelists to feel free to uh, go as long as they'd like, I mean, within reason, a minute, two minutes on each question, and then uh, the real fun is opening it up to all of you and your questions, and we will field your questions. And we have enough time, uh, so let's get at it. I, I would like to begin with something that is on all of our minds, obviously, uh, which is a really not an economic issue so much as a human tragedy, what has happened and continues to happen, the unfolding tragedy in Japan. Uh, the only reason it is appropriate to in any way uh, apply that to economics, and again, mindful that it is overwhelmingly a human tragedy, is that Japan until recently was the second largest economy in the world. It is now the third largest, uh, but it is inextricably interrelated to the United States economy in terms of Japan owning uh, a lot of U.S. debt, uh, Japan being the source, directly or indirectly, of a lot of the products that we buy from around the world, uh, Japan being uh, a part of the companies of the United States, major companies, uh, again, directly or indirectly in terms of subsidiaries and suppliers. Uh, and so I'd like to ask the panel, and, and uh, again, this is with full understanding that uh, Jesse, your area of social policy, and Liz, your area of state government finance policy may not be, I'm not, I don't want to put either of you on the spot, and Mickey, I don't want to put you on the spot either, uh, but I would like to have a little bit of a discussion about what Japan means, if anything, uh, for the U.S. economy and the global economy. And uh, anybody want to start, Mickey? Okay. Um Okay, so Bob, as you said, it's a human tragedy. In terms of, of, of the economic impact, um, you have to be a little dispassionate here. Um, it's, it, this, of course, is going to hit the Japanese economy hard, um, particularly in the second quarter, but then economics is strange in the following way. The construction and rebuilding adds to Japanese GDP, so just like in the U.S., when the, when the Japanese government, when they actually write a check to a contractor that's cleaning up, that goes into Japanese GDP. So you're gonna see a sharp hit, but then it's going to build back up. In, in, in terms, of, and another point about Japan, and I was um, over last weekend and about every day I'm in touch with the Bank of Japan, and they've, the Bank of Japan has, has poured tons of liquidity into the market to guarantee the payment system um, and, and, and they're going to have to move very quickly to provide financial support, fiscal support, and so they're doing all the right things and we just have to hope that the Japanese government um, doesn't bungle along like it usually does, that it actually is proactive. Um, so so the, the hit will be in the near term um, but, but then the reconstruction, everything adds to GDP. As far as it affects the U.S., um, the U.S. exports, about 6% about of our exports go to Japan. Um, we are Japan's second largest trading partner behind China. Um, and the critical issue is, is the, um, how the, the Japanese companies and their, their, their um, a lot of them, like Toyota, others have 
stop production for now because they need to, to retool and recalibrate all their precision instruments and the like in the production. How the supply chain affects U.S. production. Now, we know in the auto industry, for example, um, there's, a, there's a pretty healthy backlog of supplies, so it shouldn't have that big of an impact. Um, and, and the U.S., you know, like the, the semiconductor industry is diversified a fair amount away from Japan. So it, you know, I feel awkward, but it shouldn't have that big of an impact. And as a kind of official forecaster, I might take off a couple, a, a tenth off a of U.S., not much more, um, maybe a couple tenths. And the other point I would make is that, like Gary Kay, my classmate, asked about about the um, yen. Why, why is the yen appreciating? And the, the, you know, the yen had been, had, had been going up despite pretty weak economic conditions in Japan. The reason why the yen has been going up since the, the earthquake is global financial market partip participants perceive that Japanese institutions will be repatriating yen to, to finance all their near-term operations. So just the expectational effect um, drove up the yen. And then l last night, the, the uh, Japanese <coughs> finance minister, along with the, um, the, the G20, I believe, uh, announced a, a coordinated intervention. Um, and, they, and so the, 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 as part of that intervention, the US Treasury ordered the Federal Reserve to um, sell yen. And in fact, it's work, the yen has simmered down some. And so I like the coordination, and I, Bob, so far I like what I see coming out of the Japanese policymakers, but even, but the GDP numbers are just not gonna capture the enormity of the destruction. Um, let me, uh, thank you, uh, Mickey. I want to follow up, but I want to also give uh, Jesse and Liz an opportunity to. I don't have too much more to add. I'm no expert on Japan. Um, obviously, the, there are many Japanese people who are very badly, badly off in Japanese companies and people who are poorer as a result of this. There is a sense in which this is going to be giving you know, in a very perverse way, giving a lot of us what we've been yelling for and screaming for for years, which is we wanted looser monetary policy and we wanted governments to start digging holes and filling them in again. Well, we don't have to dig the hole, but we can now start filling them in and hiring people to do it. And so this amounts to monetary and fiscal stimulus, which will have some small effects, even nowhere near enough to offset the, the tragedy, but, but on, in, in economic terms, that may be helpful. The downside risk is the one that, that Mickey mentioned, and he, he suggests it's not that bad, is the supply chain side. If there are crucial components that are made in factories that, that are now underwater that, and, nobody, and there aren't enough inventories, then that could be a problem. But, and, and if we didn't get a wake-up call in the 1970s about the need for a, a national energy policy, if you look at the U.S.'s dysfunctional energy grid, electric grid and everything else, um, Oh boy, is this a wake-up call? Put the, the 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 emotional nuclear issue on the sideline. Just say the U.S. should use this as a wake-up call for our desperate need for a cohesive energy policy, because one of the problems Japan faces is is their you know their electric grid. They're just thinking through their, just energy and needs is just it's probably better than ours, but it's totally inefficient. Uh, Liz, I, I would assume that to the extent that there are trade effects, uh, to the extent that uh, the interweaving of the Japanese economy and the United States economy has some effects, California is one of the first to feel them. I mean, I do know, Bob, that about $48 billion of exports went to Asia from California in 2009, so it, it certainly is one of our biggest uh, trading partners, and particularly with computers and that. But I don't really have anything to add to the discussion that we've had. Let me ask all of you, though, in terms of confidence, I mean, an economy has a psychological side. A global economy uh, is uh, arguably uh, responsive indirectly or directly, even more psychological 
uh, uh, aspects to shocks. If you combine uh, what has happened in Japan uh, with uh, the Middle East, uh, the uh, disruption with regard to oil and crude oil prices heading upward, uh, combine that with uh, some terrible harvests around the world uh, resulting in food prices uh, heading upward. Uh, combine all of that with uh, just uncertainty about uh, how to get out of the Great Recession, China raising interest rates, worried about inflation, uh, the European Central Bank uh, uh, really pulling way back in terms of monetary policy. Uh, are, we, uh, you know, are we in for a period of uh, a kind of a rocky period ahead? in terms of uh, uh, just uh, the, 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 either, either the reality or the psychology of uh, global tumult. Mickey, do you want to? Sure. Um, the ECB is not really aggressively pulling back. Um, basically, the US economy is, uh, was gaining a nice head of steam and, and the earlier monetary uh, stimulus, you know, with it always works with a lag, and it, it was starting to gain traction. Um, uh, the the job situation in the U.S. Um, I expected was going to improve a lot, so the economy is gaining momentum, and now we get uh, two negative supply shocks thrown at us, and um, once again, thinking purely as an economist, the biggest negative is oil. And, and that's driven out of the Middle East by event risk. So nobody knows how to predict oil prices. Um, but but keep, keep in mind, it's not how high oil prices go, um, but how long they stay high. And so if, if we think about it, um, um, U.S. Um, households and businesses have a, have a very short, inelastic demand for, for energy in the short run. And so the higher energy prices um, reduces the amount of quote unquote disposable income for, for non-energy consumption. And so it's, it's going to hit the economy um, and it also hits it in the psychological way you're talking about in that uh, you know, empirical work shows a direct linkage between like the University of Michigan consumer confidence numbers um, and, and, and um, gasoline prices, and of course, the, you know, when, when people's psyches are jarred, um, that affects the stock market, and the stock market, you know, falls and works through the wealth effect on consumption, and then, and then I think it's also very important to, to bring out the higher oil price, the higher energy prices uh, increase the cost, business operating costs, and, and, and right now, um, they're, they, they're not passing on the costs, except at the gas pump. But most manufacturing businesses are, are, are squeezing their margins, and so they feel it. So this is, it is psychological, and the, the real difficulty about f thinking about things and forecasting is, once again, um, nobody knows what's going to happen to, to oil prices. Um, and this is, this is the critical issue. Now, one point I'd like to add to what you said about uh, food and food prices is uh, <clears throat> global commodity prices aren't just going up due to um, poor harvests. Um, the biggest central bank in the world, uh, the US Fed, um, through its quantitative easing um, and, and, and effort to push down the dollar, um, all oil globally and all commodities are transacted in dollars. So you've seen um, the cost of materials and, and commodities, as well as gold and food prices, go up a lot. And, and this is, so, so there's a double-edged sword to all this stuff. And so um, are we in for a rocky time? Depends on oil prices. And, and anybody in this room, their guess is as good as anybody else's about how high prices go and how high they stay there. Uh, I, I want to get um, Liz and Jesse in, and there are a lot of questions about what is going on in your domains. Just to follow up, though, uh, the uh, Commerce Department, I think it was just reported that uh, for February, 
food prices, wholesale food prices, went up 4%, uh, the, the fastest r rise, I believe, in about uh, 25 years. Uh, do you think most of that, from what you're saying, Mickey, is due to uh, the, uh, the, the fall in the, in the dollar, or is it mostly due to uh, problems with regard to global harvests and, uh, and supply? I'd, I'd say a hefty portion of supply beginning last summer with the, um, the horrible wheat, crop, wheat harvest in, in um, Russia. But these prices are going to continue to go up. And, and one other point, and we read about um, sharply higher inflation in like China and, and China's raising rates, India, um, Malaysia, South Korea, is in emerging nations, um, food is, is well over 30% um, of their CPI. So a lot of people mistakenly make the view, uh, come to the view that it's just food prices push, pushing up inflation. No, that's incorrect. In those countries, um, you've had extraordinarily easy monetary policies, strong economic growth, and so the, the whole array of prices are going up. So the, the key question there is, even if it weren't um, bad harvests, to what extent will the U.S., um, the U.K., the Eurozone, and now Japan, to what extent will we import um, higher prices from these emerging nations, which are no longer small, and they're, they're major exporters? So that's, that's a big issue. Uh, Lee Friedman, uh, a member of our faculty, uh, utilizing the faculty privilege of asking a question or making a comment. I'd like to um, uh, strongly support uh, uh, the uh, point that Mickey uh, mentioned earlier about uh, the effects, the effects on the energy sector uh, of the uh, of Japan. In, in Japan, uh, the uh, electricity grid has grown up in a way that's sort of like the United States. You know, that's interesting, Lee. So, 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 so let me finish my point and then, then you can uh, whatever, whatever you want. So I think the impetus to countries to have smart grids to do that more quickly is fantastic. It, it's good. And, and those, that's the kind of work that, you know, that people do in their own countries. There's so much disruption in the country itself. It puts people back to work all over the place. That's very good. The, the, um, the effects on the new Uh, Liz, do you want to or add anything? Uh, uh, because that uh, does get us, uh, Lee, into uh, questions of uh, fiscal policy in terms of whether we make the kinds of investments 
in our energy grid or infrastructure or anything else we are talking about. Uh, certainly in Washington uh, and in California, given the fiscal strains, we are not making those kinds of investments. Uh, is this something that we have reason to worry about? Uh, first of all, in the short term, uh, are we running a fiscal policy that is basically too uh, deflationary or uh, not nearly expansive enough? Who wants to begin? Um, so I think, I think the case is pretty clear that there are two strong cases to be made for, for putting a lot more resources into, into investments in smart grid and energy and all sorts of other things right now. One case is that it's really cheap to do it right now. If we're going to do it ever, we might as well do it when it's cheap, when, when there are lots of workers out there who will do, their, do the job for half the wage that they would have charged at another time, and, and when you can borrow the money to do it at, at half the rate you would pay at another time. And another reason is that we actually need the goose to our economy. Uh, we're, we haven't gotten to the U.S. macroeconomic situation yet on this panel, and so I won't spend a ton of time talking about it right now, but we're in a deep, deep hole, and we're, while we're starting to see the way out, it's going to be a long, slow climb out, and anything we can do to speed up that, that exit, speed up the, the, the demand to, to get us out of this hole, I think would, would, would be helpful. Um, and the most obvious thing we could be doing right now is hiring workers and putting them to work and getting, putting money in their pockets that they then spend at the store and at the gas station and everywhere else, and that puts more money in other people's pockets. And so there's a very strong case to be made right now, I think, that even if there were nothing productive for them to be doing, we should be hiring people to, to, do, to work, at, at, even if we got nothing out of it, and if we can get something out of it, and if the price of getting something out of it is lower than it will ever be again, then we should absolutely be doing more. But wait a minute, Jesse, I, I mean, what about, I'm going to put my Republican hat on, which is very hard for me to do, <laughs> and it doesn't fit well, but what about, what about, what about, what about the budget deficit? Don't we have to worry about that right now? We have a long-term budget deficit. We should have a big deficit right now in the short term. We've got a, that, that's what, that, that's what cyclical fiscal policy is all about. You run deficits in bad times and you pay them back in good times. And I, there's no sign in the bond markets that we're having any trouble persuading people that we'll pay off that debt. In the, and so I don't, I don't think that should be a reason not to do something right now, particularly if it's going to be something we're going to do anyway. It doesn't, if, if, we're, if it's something we would do five years from now and we shift it forward to doing it today, then all you're talking about is borrowing for five years. There's no sign whatsoever that anybody's worried about a short-term debt crisis in the United States. I think the concern is in the long term, but the long term concern is all about can we figure out how to make medical costs not go up as fast as they've been going up. Uh, Mickey, you agree I, with that? Yeah, I, just, I just completely disagree with your whole premise. And um, <laughs> a, a counter to what you're saying is if you look at Japan, um, during the 1990s and recently, its um, government debt to GDP ratio has risen fivefold and is over 200% of GDP, yet it hasn't driven up interest rates and it hasn't driven up inflation, so you're looking at the wrong area. The critical point I would like to make here, that um, the vast majority of um, economists fail to recognize when they debate fiscal policy, and certainly Congress debates it kinda, but mostly not, is what's critically important is um, as much so as the size of the budget deficit and the total stock of debt is how we're allocating national resources. Okay, so the whole notion of, um, you know, trying to stimulate the economy by paying people to fill cracks in roads, um, that doesn't add to productive capacity. So, so the, the critical point here is um, our, our fiscal policy tends to be driven by, you know, deficit bean counting games without thoughts of how we're allocating national resources. Um, that is, are we adding to the, uh, the, the government's debt? What are we doing to long-term capacity? And, and let me just toss out, I, uh, um, about a month ago I was asked by the, the, um, 
the state council, the PRC in Beijing to make a presentation. And I, so I went over and I, and I put together the following table and, it, and it, it's kind of striking. Um, as a percent of GDP, um, the US consumption is 70% of it. In China, it's 35. Um, fixed investment in the United States, it's 10%. In China, it's 45. In um, Japan and Europe, it's 50% higher than the US. It's about 15. Um, we as a nation are misallocating national resources. Um, and so if you think about it, if you look at a, a pie chart of, of the budget and you ask, how are we allocating national resources through transfer payments, through investments, um, we're misallocating them. And if you think about investment, Technological innovations and productivity are embodied in, in, these, in these investments. So I know right after um, um, President Obama, when he first came into office um, with great fanfare, passed the, the fiscal stimulus package, I wrote an article um, arguing that um, the U.S. should have adopted China's fiscal stimulus package and they should have adopted ours because 80 percent of theirs were geared toward um, long run investments that add to their productive capacity and 80% of ours were geared toward income support to fuel current consumption that didn't add to productive capacity. And it's really interesting to think about from a public policy point of view, why does China keep doing the same things uh, when they know they need to change and become more consumption oriented? And why does the U.S. continue to rely on um, policies that have a poor track record? So I don't quarrel with the point you make that, that deficit spending now is okay, but, but let's think about how we're spending it. And, and you know, uh, Professor Friedman, your, your point about an, an energy grid, um, critical infrastructure programs, um, let's spend a ton of money on those and education, broadly conceived, and let's, let's rationalize um, how we're allocating our national resources through, through, the, through the government. Well, I want to get Liz in here because particularly at the state government, I mean, given the California's size uh, and uh, given the issues we've been talking about, about uh, investment, it would seem that California is sort of a model for uh, the concerns that Mickey has expressed. That is declining investment in education and infrastructure and more spending on things that may be not related to growing capacity like prisons, <laughs> for example. Well, I'm not sure exactly what I can, can add to this, but I certainly would agree with, with Mickey of the, the fiscal policy needing to make choices and decisions. I mean, right now the state of California is facing about a $27 billion pro budget problem. That's a two-year problem. The legislature, as you may know, uh, covered about half of that yesterday uh, in terms of budget reductions. Education was hit pretty hard. Uh, K-12 in particular, a lot will depend whether the tax measures get on the ballot and are approved by the public if they do get on the ballot. Uh, but it's very hard, I think, for California to move forward until it really does come to terms with its budget crisis because, just to harken back to the economy, uh, most forecasters don't see employment in California getting back to pre-recession levels until 2016. So we're not going to grow ourselves out of this budget problem. We really have to finally kind of come to terms with it. Now, the voters did pass an, a number of infrastructure bonds that are still authorized and can be allocated, but until we really close our budget hole, and I think, frankly, looking at some of the political polarization uh, in California is going to give some investors some pause uh, in, in terms of how we move forward. So um, 
as, as tough as the pill is, I think we have to finally bite the budget pill because we have a structural budget problem that remains unresolved until we resolve that. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to move forward to address the countless number of issues that really do need addressing. Uh, but Liz, if we could uh, uh, just focus for a moment on Mickey's point about how the budgets are allocated, federal and state. Uh, what have you seen? Have you seen a pattern? You've been there in the legislature advising for 30 years. Have you seen a pattern, uh, some trends, in terms of allocating the California budget that should concern us over and above or beside or separate apart from the question of the deepening deficit? Well, I think certainly some choices were made in good times to uh, fund what might now be considered lower priority programs. The largest part of the state budget, though, has always been education and remains education. Uh, health and social services, if you look historically, had grown to about 25% of the budget. Uh, transportation, if you looked in the 60s, was about 10%. It's shrunk to probably about 6% now. Uh, Parks and recreation, fire, and some of your resources areas also have shrunk. So uh, correction certainly has been one of the areas that has grown significantly over the last 30 years. When I first joined the analyst's office out of GSPP, it was really a kind of what I'd call a backwater budget. And uh, now it's about 6% of the general fund budget. But one of the things that's grown fastest just in percentage terms is actually debt. And one of the things that we did to try to get the state's budget in order was ask the voters to approve uh, going out to the private equity markets and borrowing to actually fund past operations. So the, <laughs> we're, we're now paying in debt service for our choices to fund past operations, which then is taking money out of being able to fund current operations and current priorities. So I, I certainly, uh, have paused with the decisions that have been made, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, because I think we have not uh, really bit the budget bullet since about the coming out of the 1990 recession, and we've tried to pass the problem on to other generations to solve. Uh, going back, though, I, I, it seems I, I, I want to try to summarize where the panel is now, if I can, because we've talked mostly uh, about macro and a little bit about Mickey, Mickey's point about allocating how government is, is spending money. But do you all agree with Jesse's point, and I think you said that you did, Mickey, the broad point that fiscal policy right now needs to be more expansive. We should not be worrying about budget deficits at the federal level. Liz, does that, do you agree with that? Well, I think we've certainly had a positive stimulus effect from the federal action in, as it's affected the state budget. Um, I'm not sure the cards are there politically at the moment to see more stimulus coming this way, and so we have to, at the state level, take that into account. The state has much more limited uh, levers in terms of stimulus that it can do, and, and particularly in our current situation, I don't see that happening too much. But you have at the state level a total fiscal drag. If you add up all the states and all of the cutting they're doing of about 100, over $100 billion this fiscal year, uh, that is presumably a big drag on the economy at a time when there is already an issue of aggregate demand. Uh, what about the federal government? I mean, in the, in the best of all worlds, if we had the political capacity of the federal government, should the federal government be bailing the states out, providing loans against future uh, payments to the states? Well, I really don't feel, I, I'm the only non-economist on this panel, and uh, <laughs> so I, I really don't feel comfortable in trying to address it further. Mickey? Let me address your earlier, you asked if I'm comfortable with more fiscal stimulus. Um, in general, the answer is no, and let me, uh, but I'll qualify that to say if there's a good program, yes, but um, I'd like to bring out a simple fact. Um, right now, the level of GDP is above where it was at the peak of the previous expansion, but we're doing so with seven and a half million fewer workers. Okay, so the economy in the broadest context has, has recovered, 
but with seven and a half million fewer workers. So, so the so so let's let's refine your question in that context to. Um, do we need more fiscal stimulus to create jobs? Okay, because we already have G GDP is rising, and and the answer to that question, in my mind, is um, I'm generally against you know heaving money to people to for temporary jobs. Um, uh, you know when the you know when your when your committee uh, came up with its fiscal stimulus package the the, the the, um, the, the, the big, all the, the lines in Washington were, well, an efficient fiscal stimulus package has to be in the three T's. They, what do you use? You use it has to be uh, uh, targeted, um, what? Timely. Timely and temporary. And I say, wait a second, didn't my economics, text, economics one textbook tell me that temporary programs don't work precisely because they're temporary? So, so the answer to your question is what we need to do is, is dig into this issue of how do we generate permanent jobs in this changing world um, and do so in an efficient way? And that's uh, very different than just saying, let's increase deficit spending by X amount and, and it's going to generate, put, put money in people's pockets so they'll spend it, because that's not how the economy works. But is it just jobs? And uh, le uh, Jesse, let me, you were chief economist for the best department in the federal government. And, <laughs> and, let, and let me ask you this question, because uh, of the 1.2 million jobs that have been created over the past uh, year, uh, 13 months, uh, the vast majority have been pay are paying lower than the median pay of the jobs that were lost uh, during the prior two and a half years. Uh, and that is uh, really not all that different from a pattern that we've seen in this country uh, for many, many years. Uh, the median wage or the median hourly wage is basically adjusted for inflation going nowhere, and yet uh, corporate profits are very high. As Mickey told us, the entire economy continues to grow. Uh, is there something wrong with this picture? And if there is, what can be done to right it? There's certainly something wrong with this picture. Let me put off responding to that, though, to make a couple of points about the short term, and then because I think there is a long-term problem that, that that gets at. But the sh in the short term, Yes, GDP is higher than it was at the beginning of the recession, but it's still about a trillion dollars where it should have been had we not had a recession. And we usually, we usually think that, that GDP should grow every year, and we're, if we had grown at, at historic rates, we would be a trillion dollars higher than we are now. So we are still in a deep hole. I don't disagree at all with, with the idea that we should, be, we should be thinking about how we allocate our resources and, and putting our resources into investments in the future. But I do think we do need to keep in mind that one resource that we have is, is the the human capital of our workers, and right now we're burning it up. It's not, it's not being used for consumption or for investment, it's just being wasted. If somebody's sitting at home collecting an unemployment check or not collecting an unemployment check, they're not, they're not, no, if you, they're not making anything to consume, they're not making anything to invest, it's, they're, they could be making something, it's, we're, just, we're just passing up that opportunity. And worse, that's the way economists think about it. The way people think about it is that unemployment is worse than, not having, than just not working. It's miserable. And, and that's, that's a huge human loss that we're, that, we're not, that we're passing up. And so I don't disagree that we should be picking programs carefully and, putting the, and using fiscal stimulus to invest in the future, but I guess I would put the emphasis a little bit differently that the most important thing is to stop burning up our, our resources, and the next impor most important thing is to make sure that when we use them, we use them for, for investment. In the longer term, there, has been a, there have been very worrying trends, which I think are contributing to our ability, our, slow recovery out of, the, out of this recession, which is that, that there has been much, a big worsening of the, of the inequalities in our society, and, and particularly in earnings. There are um, a, a large fraction of income growth over the last few decades has gone to the very wealthiest 1% or 1 tenth of a percent or 1 one hundredth of a percent. And, um, and jobs for typical workers have, have stagnated. Wages haven't really gone up very much at all, if at all, um, and, and that's a real problem. And it's also a problem for getting out of this recession. It's a problem in the long run, obviously, 
the goal of this is to make typical worker, the goal of economic policy is to make typical people better off, not just one tenth or one one hundredth of one percent of people. Um, but it's also a problem for our economic recovery because even as corporate profits are recovering, even as GDP is recovering, the, the benefit of that is all redounding to a very, very small share of the population who don't have much tendency to, to spend that money. And so if we want to get spending happening so that to, to lift demand and, and bring back jobs, we need money to go to people who will spend it. And the people who benefit from growth these days in, increasingly don't spend it. Uh, which gets us to the question of the relationship between jobs and wages. Uh, there has been a contention that one of the reason we, uh, reasons we have such high unemployment and we may have continued to have high unemployment is because Americans have priced themselves out of the global, global labor market. Uh, and maybe that is also responsible for the stagnation or in many cases decline of wages, particularly uh, if you look at the bottom half. Uh, is that the case? And if so, what do we do about it? I think to some extent, you know, the, the, the globalization of the um, goods and, and labor markets um, does put downward pressure on real wages in the U.S. Um, and, and um, you know, so, so, if, so if we consider now, and I'll use China as an example, their, their um, wages and, and unit labor costs are way below the U.S., and you know, luckily we don't live in a zero-sum world, so we benefit from, from uh, Chinese efficient production and, and, and exports to the U.S., but it does put all else equal. It puts downward pressure on our real wages, and the, the critical issue is you know, how to respond to that. Okay, if we respond by increasing skill levels, um, but, but it goes way deeper than that. If we uh, invest in, um, in technologies or research that, that develop whole new sectors that, that of labor that don't exist now, um, those are real good permanent jobs and we need those. Let me, let me bring it home. I, I have a table here where I track every month what's happening to employment by sector. And if we take that seven and a half million jobs we've lost since the last expansion peak, um, two million of those are in construction. Okay. Um, are those, do we even want those jobs to come back? But, but will they, and are their skills transferable? And, um, so this internationalization is quite striking. Let me, let me put an international twist on it. Um, we're all kind of familiar, and I, I study closely what's going on in Europe. And if you look at, at um, I'll use two examples. If you look at Greece and Ireland, it's not just their fiscal problems, but their unit labor costs of production are about um, respectively 25 and 40% higher than Germany's and France. So they have to incur sharp declines in, in, in real wages to get back to competitiveness. And our, we're going to face the same thing if we don't address ways to invest in our future, including skills and education. This speech could have been given in the 1970s, and it really shouldn't be a political issue. It, sh it should be an imperative, and, and we've just, we've kind of addressed it, but we kind of haven't. I'd only just add, just to bring the construction numbers home to California, about 40% of the job losses in California were in construction. And uh, so it was a very hard hit here. Education and health uh, services sector were really the only sector that was adding jobs. Jesse? I would say, in, to bring it back to your question, um, well, let me start with the construction point. I think the vast majority of the construction jobs obviously will come back. It can't be right that we will never build another house in the United States. Uh, you know, we were building more than we needed right before the bubble burst. We stopped. We'll be building, we won't get back to that level, but we will come back close to it. 
Um, and so we, w we should expect that the construction sector was, would have been hit hard by, a house by the burst of a housing bubble. It was, and it'll come back. It'll mostly come back. But you're right, some of the people will need to move into other sectors. Jesse, but I, I say half of it comes back because when we were at a peak level of, of employment and construction, um, residential investment was uh, several percentage points above its 40-year average, and we don't want to get back there. No, we don't want to get back so there. So we, we need some of those jobs will come back, but we yeah. still have a big problem. Yeah, we do. We do have a big problem. I would say, though, in answer to the question of whether workers have pr American workers have priced themselves out of the global market, the way I like to think about it is that we've innovated ourselves out of the global market. We're not making any less than we used to. We're just making it with fewer people. So it's not that it's too expensive to make stuff in the United States. We're making more stuff than we ever did. It's just that we know how we now use robots to make it rather than rather than laborers. And so the fact that that companies are deciding to put the robots here rather than elsewhere, at least to some extent, suggests that there is that we're not uncompetitive. We just need to figure out ways to make sure that the benefits of that technological improvement, which which make us all better off, that those get spread in, in some more equal way than they have been thus far. But, uh, you know, wait, wait, hold, hold on. I'm going to go, Gary, I remember Gary in 1974, uh, and, and um, he came into class in the blue room, and he had a new HP handheld calculator, and it cost something like $475 at the time. And now, you know, you could do it for, for 50 cents, what it, all the programs. And, and I want to bring this out. There are so many new industries that have created new, strong jobs that require a lot of skills. Okay. Now, how did those new industries emerge? Okay. Through investment, through sometimes the government helping out, but private industry. And, and we need a more concerted effort as a nation to not just pour money into research, but to, to, to identify areas, viable areas, where we can develop new products, new technologies, and create uh, new industries of, new sectors of employment that I can't conceive of now, but they're going to happen. We need to fund those and, because we're on the leading edge of that. I mean, what's so striking is if we look across various sectors in the United States, we're generations ahead of the rest of the world in certain areas. And we just need to get there in more areas. Uh, well, I, I, I want to turn this over to the audience in just a moment, all of you and your questions. I, I, I want to identify, though, a very interesting debate that is going on up here. Because if I hear Jesse correctly, Jesse, you're saying one of the big challenges ahead is how to spread the benefits of innovation because we are enormously productive. And if I hear you correctly, Mickey, you're saying, uh, no, the biggest challenge is how to innovate more and actually grow the economy and expand our productive capacity. I'm, I'm saying that the wealth will be spread as we innovate. Well, that, that itself is a very interesting contention because I have not seen it happen as we innovate. But let me, uh, let me open it up to all of you and uh, I'll call on you. You ask a question or you make a comment uh, and feel free to ask it of any, of any member of the panel. Uh, yeah. As you know, one of, one of the areas that I've, I've tracked over the last uh, few years has been renewable energy. And if you look back about five years, uh, we thought that uh, there was tremendous promise in what a solar industry uh, could do for the U.S. economy. One of the things that, that's happened is that we weren't alone in that thought, and the Chinese uh, basically have said, you know, the Japanese had consumer electronics, then the, the Koreans had consumer electronics, the U.S. had computers, we are now going to own solar, and we don't care what the rest of the world thinks about our pricing policies, we are going to own this industry, and they've done it, and they've done it in about a three-year period of time, 
they have driven out of business almost all of the American manufacturers or, or driven offshore almost all the American manufacturing. And so what we now have is Chinese companies coming back to the U.S. because they know our brain power is here. They're, they're putting money into R&D here, but every last bit of solar cell manufacturing is taking place off sea, uh, uh, over, overseas. How do you grow an economy, especially in terms of manufacturing jobs, when you know that everybody else out there is, is after those same markets and can do it more cheaply? You become the efficient producer. Now, now Gary, eventually, if you look at what's happening in China, um, wage, uh, um, inflation is rising probably twice as fast as the government suggests. Um, in response to, to some of the social unrest and, and, and income distribution problems in China, the Chinese government's bumping up minimum wages enormously, and, and wages are getting bid up. So, you know, don't don't extrapolate forever China's growth and their ability to get in these things, because as their um, unit labor costs converge toward global standards, you know, that that their their trajectory of growth and 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 penetration in, in some industries that we think we own will, will, will dissipate some. But I think the bottom line is, um, pure and simple, we have to be efficient producers. And, and, and also keep in mind, um, if, if China produces um, solar panels more cheap, cheaply than we do, then we benefit by that. We benefit, but you know, I, I've heard from from members of, of the the uh, the PRC who got drunk at a meeting that, that you know they don't care that it is you know a, a violation of, of trade policy that they're throwing all of these subsidies and they don't care about a level playing field. They want to own this industry and basically force the the competitive manufacturers out of business. Gee, we're like we've never seen this before. Uh, and you know, here we are again, and I appreciate the, the notion of, yes, there are some areas where we are still the most efficient producers, um, top end semiconductors uh, uh, among them. But you know, unless, unless we're all playing on equal ground, how can we hope to keep moving forward instead of just treading water or falling backward. What do you mean by even ground? Well, the, the, the notion of dumping, for example. Of what? Of, of dumping. Oh, well, well, of course. I mean, we, we want our international trade partners to be fair. Um, but, you know, everybody knows that it's those countries that are reg barriers to trade are end up hurting their standards of living the most. But so we have to think of, of better solutions. I think, you know, the auto industry is a good example. Um, I think the, our U.S. auto industry has become much more efficient and in, innovative as a consequence of the international competition. And you see that in the, in the productivity numbers, not the wage numbers, because, 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 you know, once again, real wages are, are being suppressed by, by global standards there. So I guess the way I tend to think about, about trade, um, dumping aside, obviously short-term dumping just to steal industries probably is something that we, that we have rules that we want to, that we want to prevent. But th there are a lot of things that we can do that make us all better, that make us a richer country trade among them, innovation among them, many of which have very adverse di distributional consequences. And we've, we've put a lot of effort into worrying about making ourselves more efficient, and we should be doing that. But we also need to be paying more attention into making sure that, that we offset to the costs. So when we open up our, our auto sector to foreign competition, long, that happened long ago, that made cars cheaper, and we're better off for that. But it also meant that the people who were making cars here are worse off, and we made very little effort to, to offset that to make sure that they got any, any substantial share of the, of the benefits, and we need to be more serious about that. Hey, Jesse, I, if I can just intervene, I, I think we're talking a little bit apples and oranges. I think that the, the question 
about trade and a level playing field has a lot to do with the fact that China is now fairly explicitly mounting a mercantilist policy, saying to American companies in the areas that China wants to develop, you can come here if you partner with us first. And that also extends to intellectual property. It extends to the Iwan and the currency issues. I mean, this is what Japan was doing in the 80s. And you can argue that Japan, well, look what happened to Japan. Once Japan actually caught up, uh, Japan had a lot of problems under the surface. This may not be a winning strategy. It puts your eggs in a lot of baskets that you may not want them to be in. But undoubtedly right now, I think it's fair to say Japanese mercantilism is very effective. There's a separate question, although, that I hear uh, Jesse raise, and it's a question that uh, I personally am very concerned about, many people are, and that is that we are growing as an economy, we are being very innovative, we are the richest nation in the world, we're richer than we ever have been in history, and yet we have, we're cutting education spending, we're cutting our investments in infrastructure, we are cutting social services, we are acting as if we are a poor nation, and we are also uh, seeing wages stagnate, uh, as, uh, and benefits, in many respects, uh, disintegrate. Uh, so there's something wrong here. This picture looks weird, and there's a distributional issue that has got to be faced. These are separate. No, it's not uh, separate. I mean, why, why, I mean, isn't it true that, why, why are we cutting back on education? Because we are not addressing the entitlement programs in our budget. And if we were able to address those um, like a politically response, I mean, we, we should be hiring our elected officials to make long-term strategic plan plans and everybody's known for two generations, we have to address the entitlement programs. If we address those, there'd be a hell of a lot of more resources available for education and that, social services. I think that's wrong. Uh, I think that social security is not in trouble Social, I was a trustee of the Social Security Trust Fund. It's fine for 26 years. Beyond that, uh, if you followed the recommendations of the Greenspan Commission in 1983, all we have to do is raise the percentage of income subjected to Social Security so it covers 90% of income. That's a non-issue. In terms of Medicare, the problem is rising health care costs. It's not Medicare. And it's the combination of rising health care costs with a population that's getting older very fast. We have got to do something about rising health care costs. There's a lot of waste there, but that's not Medicare itself. Medicare itself is a very efficient program. So to say that government entitlements are the problem, I think, misstates the fundamental issue. But I don't want to go over and beyond my role as a moderator. <laughs> Um, other, 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 other questions. Yes. I'm uh, stealing the power of the mic. Um, I wanted to go back to one of the comments that we had at the very beginning about going back to Japan and going back to the, some of the comments that Lee made. Um, it seems to me that there's two real problems with, you know, besides the human factor of going on with the energy problems in Japan. One is electricity is a vital input, especially in times of recovery. They don't have power plants to help them do all the work that they need to do. But second, they now are going to have to spend five, six, seven billion more dollars in energy infrastructure where, quite frankly, that money should be used in a lot of other places. You know, and this is an avoidable thing if they had just done some very simple, smart, easy, cheap investments along the way. And the comment that I wanted, or I guess the question I wanted to throw back to the panel is California is actually making a lot of those smart grid investments that Lee's talking about. We've spent a couple billion dollars on smart meters. We're um, kind of the national leader on smart grid. But are we leveraging that smartly with the rest of our budgets? Are we being good spenders saying, okay, we've made some of these investments, but are we, are we connecting that dot to the next place of where the next dollar is going correctly? So that's the question. Well, my own sense is we haven't been very strategic nor long range in our thinking. So un unfortunately, I think the bottom line is no, we haven't really been 
connecting the dots, not with infrastructure in general, or, I mean, even with the grid, and I'm not as knowledgeable as you, I think we still have the problem in number 15, where we knew about that during the electricity crisis that we had during the Davis administration, and it's still unaddressed. An energy grid um, is like any other asset that depreciates. And if you don't put money into it and upgrade it, it's gonna cost you one way or the other. But I would say in, in a wide array of, of um, government um, spending, we do not allocate our, our dollars wisely. And I just um, wholeheartedly disagree with our, our moderator on Social Security and Medicare. I've, I've studied them. Um, and, and what's so striking is there, there are a lot of countries that we used to think of as these poor um, uh, emerging nations like Brazil who are so much smarter about these programs than we are. And, and if you say ours work, well, theirs work tenfold better. For example, um, Br Brazil, um, um, its retirement age is a function of mortality rates. Hey, that makes sense. Um, but we could, we could do something like that, but put in provisions for people who are disabled, who, who need help. Um, I think, I think um, our, our Medicare system, of course we want to provide um, care for people, but I think we could do it much, much more efficiently. And that was, that was a point I was making earlier on, and that is uh, Washington on these big issues, they've turned in, into um, deficit bean counting games um, rather than you know, really identifying what are the objectives of the programs, the programmatic changes needed to get there. And I think, that's, I think it's a major sh shortfall of, of our government. Let me, let me jump in to agree with both of you to some extent. I, um, <laughs> I generally share Bob's view of, of Social Security and Medicare, but I don't think there's any question that we want to be spending our health care dollars more efficiently. I think that absolutely we need to figure out a way to do that. I think my view is, though, that we need to be doing that both in public programs and not in public programs. And there's no conceivable way in which we solve this just with Medicare. If we, if we somehow got rid of Medicare tomorrow, we would still have health care expenditures going through the roof, and we would still be, the projections that suggest that Medicare is in crisis would suggest that we'd be spending 60, 70 percent of our national income on health care in 30 or 40 years. And that's just not, it's not conceivable. One way or another, we will get health care spending under, under control. But it's hard for me to see how, how reforms to the public side of the programs alone make any substantial progress towards that. Uh, no, you, you reform Medicare, you put limits on Medicare, you think that the death panel controversy was a problem. Wait till you do that while, Medica while underlying health care costs continue to grow. Yes. Is this on? So I'm Holly Harvey. Um, what am I? Class of 86. Um, and I'm Deputy Assistant Director for the Budget Analysis Division at CBO, Congressional Budget Office. So I'm one of the bean counters, sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I guess my, uh, this has been a very interesting discussion, but the point I've been actually wanting to get back to is where I see a big disconnect. Is I don't think there's any disagreement in the need to invest in more education. What I'm wondering about is it's more than just spending money on schools. It's what are the expectations that we should have for American workers? I'm not sure that there seems to be in some places an expectation that the world will be good again when people with a high school diploma can be, you know, upper middle class wage earners. And I just think that's perhaps a wrong expectation. And yet I see around the country a willingness to accept large high school dropout rates, which I think are not just a function of the schools, but a function of the environment people are growing up in. There, there's so much, I mean, speaking as a person who's going to uh, hit Social Security as it becomes uh, insolvent, I want, part of that is because we don't have enough, the ratio of workers to 
um, Social Security beneficiaries, and yet we're losing great swaths, I think, of our, our youth to poor education. And, and we're just, I mean, talk about it. I mean, it's a waste of human capital to have people unemployed, but what a waste to allow people to grow up without being able to read and to graduate from high school or drop out in 10th grade. And I just think, I think it's a very complicated program, problem that's not necessarily solved by the government alone. But I just, um, that's where I see the connection between what Mickey was saying and the fact that the wage issue, it's not that we should expect people as they are today necessarily to get higher wages if they're going to be doing the same kinds of jobs that can be paid lower in the rest of the world. I mean, a very smart economics professor I once had talked talk to me about comparative advantage. You know, but what we need is we need to be motivating people and training them to innovate and to build new jobs. I don't think we should be envisioning someday we'll have lots of factories. I don't think that's where our comparative advantage is. I think we will have lots of factories, they just won't have anybody working in them. But <laughs> um, the, and I don't think it's realistic to think that there will ever be a time in the future of the US where a high school dropout is an above, on average, an above average earner. I, you know, I think that, that education is important and skills are important. The, but it's also, and, and we need to figure out ways to, to reduce dropouts and to, to in particular, reduce the inequities in, in the system, that, that there are large chunks of the population for which we can pretty confidently expect that, that very few of them are going to get advanced degrees, and that's just not, that's not right, and it's not efficient. Um, we don't really know how to do that very well, but I guess I would say that, that I do want to raise a little bit of a caution about thinking that if we could just get everybody in, into and through college, a lot of these problems would go away. Median wages for college graduates haven't done all that well in the last few years either. Unless you can somehow get yourself into that top 1%, it, education isn't going isn't to help you. And yes, education raises the chance of getting to the top 1%, but it doesn't raise it all that much. So no, wait, wait, hold on. Um, every empirical study I've seen shows not only a benefit of having a, high, a college education, but the, the um, internal rate of return of having a, a college over a high school education is widening, is increasing. So I don't, I, don't, I don't find the, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, I don't find the whole discussion uh, pushed forward by just comparing the world to those lucky top 1% people. Um, but, but here, let me just add one point. Um, when I look at what's happening in the education sector now, I really like what I see. I mean, I, mean, I think Arnie Duncan is you know, the shining light of the administration. He has support on both sides of the political aisle. We're much more knowledgeable about the problems, and it's not just kids graduating illiterate, but in some large public school systems, um, over 10% of the teachers are illiterate. And, and so I think we're recognizing a lot of these, and if you look at some of the US um, educational attainment compared internationally, it's beyond scary, but at least now we're acknowledging there's a problem. So I'm, I'm actually a little encouraged by, by where, where we're heading in terms of education policy. Here, here's what worries me. Uh, the Detroit school system announced recently that starting next year, they're going to have 60 students in every high school class. 60, not 16, six zero. And that, they say, is necessary, made necessary by budget cuts. Um, I think Arne Duncan, I think the No Child Left Behind Act, I think the whole move toward uh, holding schools and teachers accountable for at least a, cheap, a, a, a very basic level of competence is the right way to go. What worries me is it's not being backed up by sufficient resources. The federal government uh, accounts for 8% of education spending, uh, K through 12. 
Uh, the other 92% is state and local governments, and that is where we are seeing the problem. So for Arne Duncan to be very good and to put out you know, a couple of billion dollars, that's wonderful. And for Obama, the President uh, Obama, to talk about education as being uh, the key to the future, that's great. But 92% of those education dollars are now under huge strain. Are we taxing? Are, are we taxing ourselves too high? Who's we, Kimosabi, in that sentence? <laughs> Yeah, Liz. What, Liz? What about that? California, as the biggest state by far, test case here. Uh, is it? What's the what's the proper? If you could do it politically, what's the proper mix between spending cuts and tax increases? And <clears throat> given the realities of politics, what could we possibly expect? I'm not sure what the realities of politics are anymore. I used to have a little better feel for it than today. I mean, Governor Brown, in terms of the current situation, has has proposed about a 50-50 split in terms of revenue. It's basically an extension of a tax at sunset, several taxes that sunset. But I think just going to your overall question, California is a high tax state if you only looked at the personal income tax. If you look at the whole package, state and local taxes combined, particularly compared to personal income, we're slightly above average. But I think we haven't really had the debate on what our tax policy should be, at least in California. Most of our taxes were put in place in the 1930s, and the economy has changed fairly dramatically, particularly in services and moving away from goods. Uh, our telecommunications policy was put in the 1920s. Uh, telecommunications has changed pretty rapidly. You look at the whole issue of internet taxation, and that's where I would throw it to you at the federal level. Uh, I have a good friend who owns a gift shop in Sacramento, and to get a level playing field for mom and pop on the corner is almost impossible for, in that case, a small gift shop. Uh, we've had a use tax in California since the 1930s. Uh, we're supposed to pay it on our income taxes now if you have use tax. Um, there's kind of a high noncompliance. So uh, I, I think overall to your question, uh, what at least has happened in California is Voters have approved taxes that tax someone else. So for example, uh, there was a ballot measure that if you had adjusted gross income of over a million dollars, you'd have to pay a personal income tax surcharge, and that surcharge money would go to fund mental health programs. It passed pretty resoundingly. That ended up, though, then taking really a tool out of the legislature and the governor's toolbox because there was already a higher tax rate on those high-income earners. Uh, there have been tax commissions in California, but they have not gotten much headway. And now you have the intersection, I think, with the politics. Uh, and at least in the California legislature, uh, requires a two-thirds vote of the legislature to raise a tax. Uh, in the recent election, now we also will have to have a two-thirds vote on certain fees, which will make uh, it more difficult to have a beneficiary pays principle operate. And so it is a big issue that really needs to be debated, I think, apart from the politics and more to what, what are the priorities for government services, who should pay, and how do we get fairness and equity in that system? Other questions? Uh, Carl, Carl Husker, uh, class of 81 and 86 and, and beyond, continuing student. Uh, I would like to uh, just drill down a little bit more on Social Security and whether it is a problem. 
Uh, I follow this issue kind of at the headline level. I'm an energy and environment uh, guy. But I'm, I'm keenly aware that reasonable people have very starkly different uh, views on whether Social Security ha is a problem. Uh, I lean toward the view that uh, we really do have a problem, uh, but uh, there's respectable people who say, don't worry, uh, the, the system is solvent for, dec you know, for decades, cross it off the list, it's not something we have to deal with right now. And I'd like to give a, probably Robert and Mickey, I kind of perceive you have different views on this, but, but fr frame it as uh, uh, what, I, what I think the two views are is, one is that don't worry, Social Security is good for many, many years to come because it has revenues coming in, plus it has, bar, you know, it has loaned money to this entity called the federal government that will, that's really good for its debts. It'll pay back uh, that money, so don't worry. And then to characterize, to characterize the other position, this is, this is one government. It's a, it's a unified pot of money, and uh, Social Security is going to draw on taxes plus payment back of debt and that just that comes from one, you know, federal tax base, and we we have a problem, and we have the you know the shrinking ratio of workers to retirees, as uh, as as Holly mentioned. So I'd like to give, you know, here, drill down and uh, come away with some kind of vision of whether we do have a solvency problem or not. Uh, well, I'd be happy to uh, respond uh, beyond what I said. In 1983, the Greenspan Commission came up with a whole bunch of recommendations for raising the retirement age, uh, for reducing payouts to certain groups, uh, and about 10 other things, all of which were passed by Congress. <clears throat> and they had very good data. Uh, m uh, most of their projections about economic growth, population changes, uh, the uh, aging of the population uh, have borne out to be quite accurate. So why is there a problem? Well, for one thing, Social Security got, went into surplus. And those surpluses were invested in Treasury bills. Uh, now, those Treasury bills, what, what beginning this year, the Social Security is now essentially cashing in those T-bills. And it can do for the next 26 years. This is not... Uh, it's, it's an integrated budget, yes, but, and it is true that those surpluses were used to mask the extent of the federal deficit for a number of years, but uh, as a point uh, of just uh, sheer, uh, it's not just accounting. I mean, what, this is what the Social Security Trust Fund is doing. Uh, I think most people agree that there's not a problem for the next 26 years. It's beyond that. Now, why did the Greenspan Commission which was supposed to actually fix it for 75 years, why, what did it, what was the mistake? It predicted everything pretty accurately. The one thing that it failed to predict in 1983 was the extent to which the nation's income, total income, would move to the top. That is, it didn't predict the extent of inequality. And that's why the ceiling on Social Security with regard to the percentage of income that goes into Social Security, which is supposed to be a 90% coverage of total income, is now down to 84%. And that's why the, uh, President Obama, when he looked at this last year, a group, uh, partly the Social Security Administration, partly in the White House, uh, actually came up with a rec recommendation to raise the ceiling to $180,000 gradually over time. Uh, the Obama White House decided uh, that this was not the right time to put that proposal in the hopper. But that would uh, get back to the, uh, what was Greenspan's goal, which is 90% coverage of total. We're talking about total income. Let me toss out a, a simple point. Um, is Social Security a long-run financial problem? Depends on how fast the U.S. grows. What's our potential growth? And if you look at the way the long run uh, projections are determined, the critical variables that go into it are demographics, but also very importantly, um, real wages relative to productivity gains. That is, that is, you know, long run growth. And so, if you can grow very rapidly, um, then you can afford a lot of things. Um, 
I would argue one of the, and I was on, I was on a precursor to the Greenspan Commission in 1980. I actually, it was interesting, I, I, I wrote a book um, right out of GSPP on the tax treatment of Social Security, and I argued that um, higher income people should add some, add some of their Social Security benefits to their taxable income as a, as a backdoor means tested. And of course, um, um, the Senate uh, got a hold of this and, and passed um, a resolution 94 to zero saying they would never tax any portion of Social Security and, and then it was enacted the next year. Um, the, the mistake that was made is when the age of retirement receiving full benefits uh, was, was raised very gradually, the age at which you can receive partial benefits was not raised, it's still 62. And, um, and once again, I think if you look at the, when Social Security was, was um, enacted during the Depression, the demographics were much, much, much different than they are now, and, and, and we would need to change. Um, you know, I, I also think Social Security is a great uh, example of a public policy where um, elected officials either don't know what they're talking about or they're deceiving the people. And, 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 and the best example is, is Al Gore who talked about a lockbox. I mean, when you, when you pay, when you, when you get a, 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 a when, you're, when you get your paycheck and your FICA contributions, and, and back in 1935 they didn't call them taxes, they called them contributions for a reason. Roosevelt was no dummy. Um, y your contributions go into the general fund Okay, and they're spent on every which thing. And, and then, of, then, of course, um, um, it's just an accounting mechanism. It's just like an accounting book entry that there's, there's actually um, making a profit this year or losing it. And it, it's all hocus pocus. And it's, it's, um, I'd love to take a group of, of Congress people um, up to Baltimore uh, to the Social Security Administration and, and, um, and, and try to convince them there isn't a lockbox. Um, but it's really quite striking. I think, it, now, let me put a, a personal note on this. Okay, I'm not in that 1%. I wish I were, but I'm not of, of high income people. But I, I, my income's certainly higher than average. If a member of Congress came to me and said, um, I'm going to cut back your benefits as part of a program to make the long-term funding solvent based not just on a baseline projection, but a downside projection in case things don't go right. I would say, thank you for being honest. I'll take that lower benefit. I think that's a hell of a lot better than, than, than people, than, than our elected officials deceiving the people about, um, about whether they're going to get paid. So, let me, let I'm, me jump. I don't, yeah, I, uh, can, can I, Jesse, and then I'm afraid we are just about out of time. So I want to, Jesse, and then Liz, your final words of wisdom, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Let me jump in with three points. One is that there's no deception about whether people will get paid. Either, either Congress will vote to cut benefits or it won't cut to vote to cut benefits. And if it doesn't vote to cut benefits, people will get paid. At worst, in 2042, I believe is the year, benefits will get cut slightly in order to, if Congress does nothing. But it's inconceivable that Congress will do nothing in the next 31 years on this. Um, one second point is that one way to cut benefits is to raise the retirement age. The way the formulas work, those are, there are two labels for exactly the same thing. They don't, do, they don't have any different impact. They, if you retire at a given age, they can either cut your benefit by 10% or they can raise the retirement age by a bit and your benefit stream is exactly identical. So there, there's not really a separate policy called raising the retirement age. There's just a policy called cutting benefits with, with other names. Um, one, one caveat to that is that raising the retirement age is a larger proportional cut for, for lower income people because, because 
on average, lower income people don't live as long. And so raising the retirement age takes more of their earning, of their drawing years away. The third point I would, I would make is echoing something Mickey said, which is that in 1997 and 98, I worked for an organization, I worked, did some work with an organization called the 2030 Project, which was named after the year that Social Security was due to go bust. And it was dedicated to the proposition that people in my generation would be harmed by that because we, would, we were the people who would be drawing benefits around then. And, well, we couldn't keep up, the name couldn't keep up with reality. Six months later, we should have renamed it the 2032 project, and six months after that, the 2034 project. If economic growth goes even epsilon, a tiny, tiny amount faster than, than projections, Social Security is great. For years, the, the date of exhaustion was, going, was getting pushed back two years every year. That's fine. Now, the last few years, it hasn't been doing so well because the economy hasn't been doing very well. But the idea that we should make drastic changes now based on projections that are based on very crude guesses about what's going to happen to, to economic trends over the next 30 years, when the projections are extremely sensitive to the tiniest, tiniest details of those projections, of those assumptions, the only way to make policy in this area is to wait a little bit and see, I think. I think it's just crazy to think that we should be making drastic changes every year based on, on tiny, tiny changes in these numbers that are extrapolated out far beyond anybody's ability to forecast. And now that we have two principles, one is that you can't trust polit politicians to say what's true, and the wait and see principle, Liz, our third principle of the morning. That policy analysts have a great role to play here to speak truth to power so that we can resolve just these issues that we've been talking about. <laughs> Fine way to end. Thank you all, and thank the panelists very much. <laughs>